Okay, I think it's about time to begin. Um, almost. <laughs> Hello, I'd like to thank everyone for, com for coming out today. This is going to be the second of two guest speakers for a month long um, commemoration of the Shoah through Holocaust education and awareness. Um, my name is Brian Gribben, and before I introduce some speakers, I'd like to acknowledge our other committee members who helped make this possible. Most of you know Dr. Andrew Nickel of the History Department, um, Dr. Paul Neenkamp, who is not with us today, also played a role, as well as Holly Marquis, who's joining us via Zoom, um, the History Department's grad student, uh, Matt Lemonian. Thank you, Matt as well as Chelsea Keeble, one of our online students in the history department. I still say our department, even though you had expelled me years ago. Um, <laughs> David doesn't remember that. Um, and our colleagues, both at the Hayes Public Library, Samantha Gill, Forsyth Library, Kopp, Whitney Squire, and other students um, who assisted me in some of my prolonged absences and getting some of the displays up, as well as promoting the programming um, that we have offered this month. With that said, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Laurel Kroll. He is a PhD candidate at Central European University. Um, he's working in the fields of fascism, anti-Semitism, and Holocaust studies with a focus on Central and Southeastern Europe, particularly in the ideological evolution of Croatian fascism. He holds a BA and an MA in philosophy and history from the University of Reykjavik. I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Reykjavik. And he has earned a second MA in comparative history from the Central European University. Additionally, he's held multiple fellowships, um, including the Sherwood Abelson Research Grant for the Study of the Holocaust from the Holocaust Educational Foundation and a junior fellowship at the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies. Um, many of us may be familiar with the extent to which collaboration among the inhabitants and governments of allied, allied governments to Nazi Germany played a role in you know, facilitating the, the mass murder of European Jews, um, motivated by self-interest, sometimes self-preservation, fueled by fascistic and nationalistic ideologies, and some, these and other factors. Um, Collaborators assume many different functions, many different identities. Now today, Lavra will share the story of a Croatian Holocaust perpetrator, which does illuminate the nature of genocide in Croatia. Um, this perpetrator was one of the main deportation um, experts, I'm using air quotes here, um, and was directly involved in the deportation of more than 70,000 people. Now there will be time dedicated to questions following the presentation, uh, for those attending virtually through Zoom, please direct your questions to Holly Marquis, who will be mediating those, and they'll be sharing them with our presenter um, when he is finished. And with that, I give you Mr. Lovell. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for the kind introduction. I'm very glad to be here uh, and to be with you. Hopefully, in the future, we will be able to see each other live if, if the finances plus the pandemics and other uh, horrible events allow it. So uh, our idea today is to shed light on uh, a non-German perpetrator. I'm sure you've, you're all familiar with uh, a last names such as Hitler, Eichmann, Himmler, Heydrich, and, and so on. But we'll try to uh, see what uh, the analysis of the perpetrator behavior from other countries, specifically from Croatia here, uh, can contribute to our understanding of the Holocaust and other genocides, and also to our understanding of uh, perpetrator studies. So I think that my lecture should be around one hour, uh, and then we will have plenty of time for the discussion. Uh, I am not so sure about your background knowledge, so if sometimes I go too much into detail or there is something that was not clear from the presentation, feel free to write it down and we will answer that during the Q&A uh, session. So let us begin because we have a lot to cover here. So historians working in the field of Holocaust and genocide studies 
recognized now that perpetrators are not born but made. So in this present presentation today, I will examine the making of one unfamiliar Holocaust perpetrator who was frequently remembered by his victims as simply infamous Toll. Again, the Toll pronunciation is very, not, very difficult for non-Slavic speakers, so you can refer to him in, as Toll. Uh, his fellow perpetrators recognize him as a top deportation expert in the independent state of Croatia, which is World War II Croatia, official name of the country. Considering that Toll was involved in organizing and implementing the deportations of more than 70,000 Serbs, Jews, and Roma during the Second World War in, in the independent state of Croatia, this epithet, which was designated to him by both his fellow perpetrators and by victims, was justified. And yet Toll re basically remained in the shadows of contemporary historiography, not just internationally, but also in the national Croatian historiography, he is fairly unknown. So this presentations fall within the broad scope of Holocaust and genocide studies, or to be more precise, within the subdiscipline of perpetrator studies. The perpetrator studies aims to go beyond the, the field of demonology and finds it unsatisfactory to explain the perpetrator action as some sort of inborn quality of sadism, often referred to as simply evil. Scholars have noted that we cannot afford to simply accept evil as a sole explanatory model for perpetration of mass violence because the, sta the stakes are simply too high. There is a danger of falling into a trap of seeing perpetrators as inhuman and that to find the other people, people's actions incomprehensible really means to abandon the search for understanding and thus to abandon history itself. We need to understand, we need to soberly analyze and uncover the inner logic of violence in order to fight it effective, effectively in the future. Although often repeated in studies of mass violence, one can never overstate that those efforts to explain perpetrator behavior are not intended either to excuse or to forgive the perpetrator actions. So far, when it comes to Holocaust scholarship, uh, scholars almost exclusively focused on German perpetrators. We have studies on top-ranking Nazi officials who are considered as the architects of genocide, mid-level organizers of the genocide, and at the bottom, the killers themselves. Most often, or probably you've, you've worked with and heard of Christopher Browning, who dealt with the murderers or the executioners in the field itself, self, the so-called ordinary men. <clears throat> However, the historiography of the Holocaust remains rather weak when it comes to non-German Holocaust perpetrators. The Holocaust itself was a transnational historical event, a pan-European one, where almost 10% of the victims actually never saw a German per perpetrator. It was mainly Croatia and Romania, World War II collaborator states, which provide us with the case studies of autonomous powers which participated in the Holocaust and actually organized the mass murder of Jews on their own territories, outside of the scope of German supervision or German perpetrators on the field. So studies of individual perpetrators provide us with an opportunity to carefully contextualize ideologies and institutions, which are often portrayed in an impersonal way in studies which focus on the macro picture. So exclusive focus on the macro level, level or the architects of genocide risks overlooking the importance of mid-level organizers who remain largely neglected in perpetrator research in general. Per perpetrators on the ground, such as Ivan Toll, tend to remain invisible when crimes are e examined from the perspective of central institutions. So let us turn to, to the perpetrator who we will examine today. Ivan Toll was born at, at the turn of the century in 1901 in a small village in southeastern region of Herzegovina. His childhood was marked by hunger and poverty. And by the time when he was 15, Toll's native region of Herzegovina has experienced a devastating famine, largely caused by the start of the First World War. 
The situation was so dire that many parents willingly surrendered their children to foster care in homes in the more prosperous and fertile regions of in the north of Yugoslavia. Ivan Toy was presumably one of approximately 17,000 children who were evacuated from the famine struck areas. He settled 300 kilometers away from his birthplace in Subotica, which you can see here. Do you see my mouse pointer? Yes. So Herzegovina is here around the town of Mostar. He, here he was born and he moved to Subotica and this is uh, very close to the river Danube, which is a very fertile land, this entire northern area of uh, Yugoslavia. So the town of Subotica was a multi-ethnic city populated by Hungarians, Croats, Serbs, Germans, Jews, and either min minorities, owing it to the Austro-Hungarian Austro legacy, which the city enjoyed. Tori quickly assimilated into the new surroundings, into the new surroundings. He married, had a child, and became an active citizen by maintaining membership in both local Croatian organizations, but also in those which transcended ethnic boundaries. He graduated from law school in 1933, which positioned him within the educated elites. At the time, only about half percent, 0.5 percent, of the population of Subotica actually had a higher degree which meant that Toll was belonging to the city elites. Nevertheless, he struggled to secure permanent employment, where he later argued that he was discriminated because of his pro-Republican and pro-Croatian attitudes. You should keep in mind that the Kingdom of Yugoslavia was in fact the kingdom ruled uh, by the Karadžorđević dynasty. What is remarkable about Toll's interwar life is the spectacular normality or ordinariness of his life. Toll showed no propensity towards political extremism. He didn't have a criminal record. He even worked for the city authorities, which was considered to be pro-regime, which meant pro-court or pro-Serbian uh, uh, at the time because the Serbian parties dominated the body politic. He didn't belong to any fascist organization. He didn't show any interest in joining any of the fascist organizations at the time. However, this was all about to change on 6th of April, 1941, when the Axis forces led by Germany invaded the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. The Yugoslav army collapsed in a matter of days and Yugoslavia was dis dismembered into various occupation zones and satellite states, which you can see on this map in front of you. Toll's hometown of Subotica was occupied by the Hungarian troops, as is seen here. And the new authorities tar targeted the non-Hungarian population for majorization, which meant assimilation into the Hungarian nation politics. South Slavic groups such as Serbs and Croats, who belonged to the city elites, meaning being lawyers, teachers, members of the clergy or doctors, were perceived as a particular threat which could obstruct the planned majorization. Non-Hungarians who settled in Subotica after 1918 were particularly vulnerable to arrests or deportations by the newly formed Hungarian authorities. Belonging to both categories, Toll fled Subotica to avoid persecution and together with his family, he found refuge with his brother who lived in the Croatian city of Osijek. So he moved from Subotica, which you see here, to the city of Osijek, which you can see here on the map. The city of Osijek fell within the uh, newly formed borders of the independent state of Croatia, which you can see in its full borders here in between something that is red or brown. So the independent state of Croatia. Uh, it was, the country was a direct product of Axis invasion of Yugoslavia and it was proclaimed on the 10th of April, 1941. It consisted of contemporary Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Northern parts of Serbia, which you can see here. Catholic Croats formed a thin majority in the total population of roughly 6 million, uh, which, which independent state of Croatia hosted. 
And the country was ruled by the Ustasha movement, a fascist organi organization which based its ideology on xenophobia, chauvinism, ultranationalism, anti-Semitism, and totalitarianism. From the outset, the Ustasha regime considered the multi-ethnic and multi-confessional diversity of the country, where virtually half of the population consisted of minorities such as Serbs, Germans, Hungarian, Jews, and Roma, and others, to be an existential threat to the Ustasha rule. In other words, they aimed to create an ethnically homogenous state. The Ustasha perceived the, mis the minorities as obstructing the plans for the new beginning and the rebirth of the nation, which was proclaimed by the fascist authorities. Therefore, the reducing the number of minorities through ethnic cleansing was of utmost importance for the Ustasha leadership. Just to give you a broader map to see where the independent state of Croatia was located, you can see it in dark red here in Nazi-occupied Europe. And here we will move on to the quote uh, to understand what the aims of the Ustasha regime were from the outset. So here you can see the quote of Eugen Dido Kvaternik, who can be described as the Himmler of the independent state of Croatia because he was at the head of the security apparatus of the newly formed state. He said in the beginning of the war, uh, I mean, reflecting on the beginning of the war later on during 1941, he said, when we victoriously came back from emigration, Ante Pavlic, meaning the leader of the Ustasha movement, decided that I should oversee the measures taken against Jews and Serbs. I immediately took this task without any hesitation. I knew that the attitude of Jews towards the ideals of Croatian people, and I was aware of the role which they played for the decades in Croatian political life. I knew that this question had to re be resolved for the future of the Croatian people and the state. Someone had to sacrifice himself for it. Someone had to implement these hor horrible but necessary measures. Okay, so you can see here already the outlines of the Ustasha uh, central policies, which I said were genocide and ethnic cleansing of minorities, and these were primarily ethnic Serbs, Jews, and Roma. And this was ingrained in the political project of the independent state of Croatia basically from day one, from the establishment of the state. So in order to accomplish uh, these political aims, the Ustasha needed manpower. You should keep in mind that just before they took control in the independent state of Croatia, the Ustasha movement had around one to 2,000 sworn members. In other words, it was a tiny political organization. Even though Toll was not a member of the Ustasha movement, he was aware of these issues through the mediation of his brother, who I mentioned before, who was an Ustasha sympathizer and an editor of the local nationalistic daily. Having, re having recently lost his property, means of income, and trying to support a family which counted on him as a breadwinner, Toll was pretty much in a desperate situation. Joining the Ustasha regime offered Toll an opportunity to find meaning in great political turmoil, as well as to reinvent himself in social terms. It gave him a chance to satisfy, had satisfy his need for belonging and to fashion a certain kind of positive identity and to grasp his role in the emergence of the new Nazi and fascist order. So in order to turn a new page at the end of April 1941, Toy wrote a personal letter to Andrei Artukovich, who was the recently appointed, the newly appointed Minister of Interior of the Independent State of Croatia and one of the most radical Ustasha ideologues. Toy's choice of writing to Artukovic, the minister, was carefully calculated. Since the two men shared the common regional background and their hometowns, the places where they were born, were only five kilometers apart. Since he had not belonged to the Ustasha inner circle during the interwar period, Toy knew that he could not count on a top office in the Ustasha regime. However, with his educational background and working experience in administration, he hoped to get a mid-ranking position as a potentially district prefect, a regional governor. 
Tolly's bid was eventually successful, and the minister Arpukovic uh, appointed him as the chief of police of Vinkovci district, which you can see here. So this is contemporary map of Croatian railways, which will be very important for us. Even though it's a contemporary map, the railway system from the Austro-Hungarian Empire pretty much remained the same up until today. So uh, Tol found refuge with his brother in the city of Osijek, which I'm pointing out here, and moved and received a new position in the city of Vinkovci, which you can see here on the map, on the, on the, in the eastern part of the map. <clears throat> so he uh, took his office in the beginning of May 1941, and this relationship between Toy and the minister of Artukovic would prove to be faithful for both men, as the, their collaboration would profoundly shape the policies of ethnic cleansing in the independent state of Croatia. Coming back to, to the city of Vinkovci, and here you can see a little bit of background information. So located in the Northeast Croatia, Vinkovci had a strategically important uh, railway. It was a major, major railway junction in the region. With a narrow Croatian majority uh, in the municipal population, the town also had a significant German, Serbian, Hungarian, and Jewish minorities, as you can see it in this pie chart. Consistent with the Ustasha ideological imperatives, the independent state of Croatia authorities initiated the persecution of Jews and Serbs immediately after the establishment of the new regime in April 1941. Even before Toy's arrival, the Usasha members in Vinkovci terrorized and beat up Jews and Serbs uh, together with the members of the ethnic German minority, the so-called Volksdeutsche. However, the arrival of Ivan Toll as the chief of police in Vinkovci marked a new escalation in the persecution of Jews and Serbs. Instead of bottom-up violence, which proved difficult to control, Toll wanted to implement a more systematic and organized, a certain type of top-down persecution of the targeted minorities. Around the same time that Toll took his position in Vinkovci, Nazi Germany began implementing a major plan for the ethnic reorganization of Southeastern Europe. The Ustasha regime made a deal with Nazi Germany through which they would be allowed to deport around 250,000 Serbs from Croatia out of a total of 2 million inside the independent state of Croatia to the German occupied territory of Serbia. This international agreement significantly changed the importance of the town of Vinkovci and consequently advanced even to Ivan Toy's career. Since the mayor, main railway junction, as you will see on the map here in Vinkovci, you can see that the main, main railways, this is Serbia, yeah? So the main railways goes through Vinkovci, so any deportations from the rest of the country had to go through the town of Vinkovci, proceeding to Serbia and Belgrade itself, the capital of Serbia. <clears throat> so since the main railway from the independent state of Croatia to Serbia went through Vinkovci, the town came, uh, came to, uh, became an operational forefront of deportations of Serbs. Moreover, most of the Serbs targeted in the first waves of deportations through this agreement with Germany lived in the regions surrounding Vinkovci. As police chief, Toll oversaw securing and coordinating the deportations through and around the city. More importantly, he had also received a special assignment from the minister, Tukovic, who authorized Toll to di direct secret illegal deportations of additional Serbian population. This was to be implemented without the German knowledge. Since the deportation agreement between Germany and the independent st state of Croatia covered around 10% of the total Serbian population in, in, the independent, in, in, in the state, the Ustasha regime tried to secret, secretly deport as many additional Serbs as possible in the hope that this would, this would not be prevented by Germans. These secret deportations called for the concentration of Serbs from Slavonia, which is this region here, in a district of Vinkovci, seen here, 
from the, where they would be deported, and if you, you can follow me, so the official deportations ran through the red line, which is the official railway system, while the secret deportations, which were uh, happening simultaneously, would assemble people in the town of Inkovtsi. They would be taken through this railway system to the city of Brčko, which is here, and then marched on foot, since there is no railways here, to the city of Bielina. In Bielina, they would be concentrated and on foot, they would be forced to cross the border with Serbia. Here, you cannot see it on the map, but there is a river Drina here, which, is the bound, which was the state boundary, the, the, the official state border between the two countries. And uh, Serbian civilians were forced to march across the river or they were ferried across to Serbia proper. In just over a week, during the mid-June 1941, Croatian authorities de uh, deported at least 11,000 Serbs through this illegal deportation line. While Toy coordinated these deportations, he faced an unexpected difficulty of having to deal with a local Volksdeutsche. That is the German minority in Croatia, which occupied an important political position because of the independent state of Croatia's alliance with Nazi Germany. The Volksdeutsche constituted almost a quarter of the population of the city of Inkovci. And the independent state of Croatia provided them with a great degree of pro political autonomy. Increased political representation for the Volksdeutsche, uh, especially in comparison to other ethnic groups. Uh, the Volksdeutsche were also given the right to organize their own paramilitary organizations. These concessions from the, state, from the independent state of Croatia led contemporaries to consider that the Volksdeutsche and the independent state of Croatia were in fact a state within a state. Toy himself considered the Volksdeutsche too independent for his own taste because of their own paramilitary activities as well as their own violence against Jews. This doesn't mean that Toy was opposed to anti-Semitism itself. He simply tried to secure the dominance of the Ustasha movement and, and of uh, Croats at the time over the anti-Semitic measures, including the requisition and nationalization of Jewish property. Therefore, he was uh, trying to secure that the Jewish property would be distributed exclusively among ethnic Croats instead of being distributed among ethnic Germans who populated the area. Toy's frequent conflicts with the Volksdeutsche and his insistence that they should submit to the Croatian authorities led to a serious political conflict. The local Volksdeutsche complained to the central Eustasha authorities in Zagreb, which is the capital of Croatia, which you can see here on the map. They complained to, to the officials in Zagreb that Toy maintained anti-German attitudes. Despite Toy's prominent role in coordinating the deportations of Serbs from the independent state of Croatia to Serbia, the Eustasha leadership, leadership in Zagreb could not risk an open conflict with the Volksdeutsche, which could in turn generate a serious diplomatic incident with Nazi Germany, which officially protected all uh, German minorities across Europe. Even as it became clear that he had, that Toy had to be removed from his position in Winkovci, his involvement in the deportations of, of Serbs made him an important asset to the Ustasha regime. Toll's political patron, Minister Artukovic, transferred Toll to the city of Bielina, which I already mentioned, which was a key part in this secret illegal deportations, because as we said, the secret deportations ran through from Vinkovci to Bielina. Uh, because Bielina was one of the uh, central uh, locations in this entire process of deportations. Therefore, the central authority, the central Eustasha authorities in Zagreb decided to make a compromise. They created an illusion that they would replace Toll from his position in Vinkovci, while in fact they would transfer him to Bielina and Toll's power would only increase in the future. It is here in Bielina where we can see the radicalization of Toll. 
who evolved from an official who was following orders and implementing the policies from top down from a, in an in a institutional and legal matter into, into uh, his new role where he became a more independent actor who was pushing the policies of the regime through his own initiative. In Bielina, Tolu was meant to cleanse the area, which was considered of prime importance because of its borderland status with Serbia. He received broad authority to accomplish this task. So his task was pretty much to secure the borderland, to secure the border, and to ethnically cleanse this entire territory. However, Toy immediately faced op opposition from regular units of the Croatian armed forces, who feared that the influx of dispossessed Serbs into Bijeljina constituted a security threat. The, force, the military forces of the independent state of Croatia perceived the concentration of Serbs in already highly populated Serbian region to be a recipe for a potentially disastrous rebellion. Tolle disregarded repeated complaints from the military and questioned the ideological commitment of its officers. For example, he argued that the army could not be trusted because one of its commanders was, and I quote, married to a Serb Orthodox woman. Moreover, Tolle maintained that his authority was derived directly from the Ministry of Interior, which trumped the authority of the military. Relying on Minister Artukovic's support, Toy effectively sidelined the military and other opposition within Bielina in his effort to cleanse the area. He did not merely execute orders from the top, however, for he enjoyed broad autonomy to make decisions, set goals, and implement them with whatever means were necessary. Toy argued that he had made his own decisions in all questions concerning deportations, which he then simply submitted for the approval with the Ministry of Interior. By the middle of August 1941, Toy had deported more than 27,000 Serbs through the town of Bielina. However, the most radical expression of his independence could be seen with regards to how he treated the Jewish population in Bielina. In the end of July 1941, the central authorities of the Ustasha regime in Zagreb issued an order according to which all Jews and Serbs who were even slightly suspicious of communist, communist activities were to be deported to concentration camps. This was one of the critical stepping stones in the Ustasha decision-making leading to the Holocaust in Croatia. It enabled the local security agencies to proceed with the deportations of Serbs and Jews to concentration camps without any legal or formal restrictions. A wave of deportations swept the independent state of Croatia immediately after these orders were issued. However, the dynamics of these deportations depended on the local political and security context as well as the degree of anti-Semitism among the security officials on the micro level. While in most cases, those arrested and deported were men exclusively in this first stage of the Holocaust, Ivan Toll was one of the first Eustache officials who, who started to order the mass arrest of all Jews without respect for gender or age. On the 1st of August, 1941, the police arrested all Jewish men and women and children and deported them on the next day to the Eustasha Ren death camps. In total, around 350 Jews from Bielina were arrested and deported within two days. Up until that point, in most localities across the independent state of Croatia, Croatian authorities had carried out only partial deportations of Jewish communities, meaning mostly men. The all-encompassing deportations of Jews in Bielina has set Toll apart from many other local security officials in the independent state of Croatia and distinguished him as an expert on the Jewish question in Croatia. Coordination of the illegal deportations of Serbs was one of the main tasks Toll was supposed to execute in Bielina. 
However, this task abruptly came to an end in September 1941. Repeated complaints and objections from German military authorities in occupied Serbia against such deportations escalated in a meeting during September and Nazi Germany forbade any further deportations from Croatia to Serbia proper uh, in September 1941. <clears throat> By the beginning of uh, August 1941, Cro Croatian officials were conducting mass deportations of Serbs and Jews to Ustasha managed con concentration camps and detention facilities, as I mentioned earlier. However, in this context, the city of Sarajevo, who I'm sure you're familiar with, was exceptional. Even though authorities in Sarajevo ha had subjected them, to, uh, meaning them, Serbs and Jews, to harsh discrimination and violence, Serbian and Jewish re residents of the city had not yet experienced large-scale deportations, unlike in many other locations across the state. Sarajevo's complex ethnic, religious, and political setting induced municipal leaders to emphasize pragmatism instead of radicalism, fearing that radical persecution of minorities could severely impair the functioning of local administration and even cause the economic uh, and supply chain uh, issues or the collapse of the economy on a local level. The Ustasha authorities in Zagreb were dissatisfied with the lack of initiative among the Sarajevo Ustasha, Ustasha locally. Hoping that the second largest city in the independent state of Croatia would be cleansed and thus Croatize at a faster pace. Moreover, it was believed that all the tensions in Sarajevo re re uh, referring to the lack of housing, fears of potential anti-fascist resistance, and tensions between the Catholic and Muslim elites could be resolved through the deportations of Sarajevo Jews, who constituted more than 25% of all Jews in the independent state of Croatia. Minister Artukovic himself expressed disappointment that the deportations didn't intensify in Sarajevo, unlike in other locations across Croatia, during September and October 1941. Therefore, he designated Toll to become the new police chief in Sarajevo, since Toll's role in Bielina ended because of German uh, protests to the deportations, Toll's role in Bielina become, became in a way redundant. Therefore, Artukovic sent him to a special assignment in Sarajevo to cleanse the city. He received orders to destroy all non-Croatian elements. And his mission was to remove foreign elements uh, from the city. He, received, he took over his role in October 1941, and he was given a task to assess the situation in Sarajevo, to organize further deportations of Jews, and to report on the performance of Sarajevo police, whose level of commitment to the policy of ethnic cleansing can, has generated doubt at the, at the top level security agencies among the Ustasha in Zagreb. Toll reported that the existing security apparatus in Sarajevo, in fact, lacked both the initiative and leadership. Toll's critique of Sarajevo police confirmed Zagreb's suspicion regarding its previous chiefs of police in Sarajevo. As a result, the previous chief of police, whose name was Djikovic, was relieved from his position and Toll took over his position and therefore consolidated his power in the city. On the same day that Toll assumed his duties in Sarajevo, roundups of Jews started. On the evening of 20th October, 1941, police rounded up Jewish men above the age of 16 in various parts of the city, removing them from their apartments, loading and mounted trucks, and bringing them to the local army barracks. Further arrests and deportations far followed almost on a daily basis. Here you can see the overview of the deportations in Sarajevo. <clears throat> Throughout December uh, and uh, earlier November, 
Toll's eagerness regarding the deportations, which included women and children, caused problems on the state-wide level because there was simply not enough capacity to handle such swiftness of the deportations which were implemented by Toll. His initiative to deport so many people in such a short period of time led to opening of new camps specifically designed for women and children as well as to speeding up the mass murder process in camps such as Yasinovats. You should keep in mind that Yasinovats was a Eustasha ran concentration camp and the largest death camp in Europe outside of German SS supervision. So it was a camp ran by the Eustasha and it was outside of the SS or any other German agency control. Uh, approximately 85,000 people were killed in the Asenovats concentration camp. At the beginning of the war, Sarajevo was home to approximately 11,400 Jews, making it the second largest Jewish community in the independent state of Croatia. By the end of 1941, only a few hundred Jews remained in the city. Many of them were protected as workers essential for the, muni for the functioning of the city. Some Jews were exempted from the deportations as partners in, in intermarriages were non-Jews. Others remain in hiding. In little over two months as police chief in Sarajevo, Ivan Tol had removed or deported virtually the entire Jewish population of the city. Tol's cleansing of Sarajevo was therefore not only of a local of or regional relevance, but was one of the most relevant chapters in the history of the Holocaust in the independent state of Croatia. When Tol was asked by some local Eustasha officials to justify such urgency he gave to the Jewish question instead of solving the Serbian question, which some other Eustasha officials considered the priority, Toy answered, I arrested Jews according to my conscience. After seeing evidence that they're helping the communist actions, this Chetnik communist refers to the resistance, which were directed at the destruction of Bosnia and Herzegovina and its secession from the independent state of Croatia. The great enemies of the independence of the Croatian state are Jews from Sarajevo, both men and women. All Jews are equal, regardless of whether they are honorary Aryans or whether they have converted to Roman Catholicism, Islam, or the evangelical religion or not. They all feel the same, and they all want to harm the independent state of Croatia and its allies. As a Croat and a loyal, loyal follower of Poglavnik, and Poglavnik here reverse, refers to the leader of the Ustasha movement, it has the same meaning as the Fuhrer or the Duce, in other European uh, contexts. I need to tell the truth, I'm continuing with the quote. The rebellion was caused mainly by Jews and therefore they should be quickly and thoroughly exterminated from the face of Bosnia. Therefore you can see how deeply entrenched anti-Semitism was in Toy's worldview. These words, uh, were of course untrue and there was no, no evidence that Jews had actually supported the resistance. But Toy's deeply held anti-Semitism anti justified this accusation he, he just outlined. Moreover, it was in his interest to depict the Jewish community in Sarajevo as a major threat to security in order to validate his overzealous approach to deportations and dismiss complaints from other Eustasha agencies. Toll's stay in Sarajevo was marked by frequent and fierce conflicts with some local Eustasha officials. According to multiple sources, Toll was, was a very difficult person to deal with, and he had a highly conf conflicting personality. Local Eustasha complained that he was arrogant, aggressive, and condescending towards the Eustasha and state officials with whom he interacted. The situation escalated in early 1942, when Toll decided to deport 200 leading intellectuals and public officials from Sarajevo. These were most, mostly Croats and Muslims who did not belong to the persecuted minorities, 
but Toll considered them to be a political enemies because they were not enthusiastic enough about the genocide which was being implemented. A day before this deportation was supposed to take place, police agents leaked the information to the highest ranking Ustasha officials in the city, but not the Toll, so outside of his, his circle of trust. And the Ustasha from Sarajevo probably considered that Toll planned, Toll's planned deportation of Sarajevo notables would further alienate Muslims and Catholics from the Ustasha movement in the city. This would create a major security risk in the form of potential armed rebellion against the independent state of Croatia within Sarajevo itself. Fearing the loss of control over the city if Toll was not removed, the local Ustasha leaders in Sarajevo held a secret meeting. The conspirators decided that Toll had to be arrested. With the assistance of police agents who were dissatisfied with Toll, 10 armed men barged into the police headquarters in Sarajevo and at gunpoint ordered police officials inside to stay at their desks. The conspirators arrested Toll reportedly putting him into a straitjacket and transferred him to a prison in Zagreb. Local newspapers firmly under the Ustasha control wrote about, about Toy's departure as a sensational event. And residents of Sarajevo, uh, the newspapers reported, uh, celebrated Toy's removal. Now you have, we have to contextualize this, that this is immensely important because Toll belonged to the Ustasha movement and the local Ustasha officials arrested him. So it was an inside struggle within the fascist movement itself. Perceiving Toll's arrest as an attack on his personal authority, the minister Artukovic, who was in close tie with Toll himself, was enraged. And he threatened that the Sarajevo and Ustasha who were involved in Toll's arrest would face severe consequences. Artukovic, Minister Artukovic immediately released Toll from prison and decided to put him back into the field, appointing, appointing him as a district prefect in Vinkovci again, where he was in the beginning of 1941, putting him back into his function in early April 1942. Toll's return reopened all wounds with the German Volksdeutsche, who removed him initially from the position. Volksdeutsche complained that Toll's behavior was very often erratic and that his return to Vinkovci would mean chaos. However, this time the protests of the Volksdeutsche were ignored because the central authorities in Zagreb considered it their priority to start with the genocidal cleansing of the area surrounding Vinkovci. At the beginning of 1942, the population of Vinkovci and much of Eastern Croatia, which we focused on before, had not yet been subjected to mass deportations or killing operations and retained, retained a high degree of multi-ethnicity. So earlier we talked about the deportations of Serbs, but these deportations were halted in September 1941, as I mentioned, and the deportations of Jews were slower than in other regions of the independent state of Croatia. <clears throat> so at the beginning of May 1942, Toll made extensive preparations for the deportations of Jews from Vinkovci and its surroundings. By May 1942, the local police has arrested around 380 Jews from Vinkovci, and they have deported them to Yasenovac's death camp, which I mentioned earlier. Next to Jews, Toll also started uh, with the mass arrests of Roma from the Vinkovci district. This was a prelude to the most radical genocide in the independent state of Croatia, where almost 20,000 Roma were arrested and murdered in a matter of weeks during the spring and summer of 1942. Impressed with his results, authorities in Zagreb, the Ustasha elite, put him in charge in, of concentration and accommodation of evacuees in temporary transit camps, meaning that Toll became the main person on the state level who was put in charge in organizing and coordinating all the deportations across the state. This, 
So this made Toll the single most important person in organizing and the mass arrests of Jews from Northeast Croatia, but also on a macro state across Croatia in general. As a special emissary of the Ministry of Interior, Toll visited many towns, villages, and cities in these north, northernmost uh, locations. His assignment was to, to organize the rounds up, roundups of all the remaining Jews in the independent state of Croatia. This was done in the preparation for the transfer of remaining Croatian Jews to German concentration camps, primarily to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Toll's task was to take control over the local police and gendarmerie, uh, and to assemble all of the Jewish population in the town called Osijek, which we also mentioned before because this is the first town when, where Toll arrived from Subotica. <clears throat> Toll uh, was detailed to Osijek on the 20th of July 1942 to ensure that the deportations would be implemented uh, expediously. A few days later, Croatian gendarmes seized and transported to Osijek uh, all the remaining Jews from the countryside, countryside, which increased the number of the Jewish population in Osijek itself to 3,500. Finally, during the August, uh, the, during the month of August 1942, German SS officer Franz Abromait arrived in Osijek to inspect the deportations of Jewish prisoners from the city and transport them to German controlled death camps. During the following days, German SS and police uh, officials deported around 3,500 Jews from Osijek to Auschwitz, and the Croatian authorities removed further 300 Jews from Osijek and sent them to the Croatian death camp of Yesenovac. By the end of 1942, the Croatian authorities had deported or killed most of the Croatian Jews and virtually all Roma residents of the independent state of Croatia. Toll remained the district prefect in Vinkovci, where he, con he continued to terrorize the local population through mass shooting and public hangings of civilians suspected of giving aid and comfort to the resistance movement known as the Yugoslav Partisans. Nevertheless, the power of the Partisans was growing in resp response to the Ustasha terror. The situation was, was quickly deteriorate, de deteriorating for the Axis forces, as well as for the Ustasha themselves from 1943 onwards. At the end of the Second World War, the police officials of the newly formed uh, Yugoslav socialist state, which was led by Josip Broz Tito, who also headed the partisan movement, arrested Ivan Tol shortly after the conclusion of hostilities and transported him back to Vinkovci in 1945. Toll was forced to march through the street, city streets where the gathered crowd shouted, down with the Ustasha bandit, I quote, and debt to the traitors, end of quote. A Yugoslav military court uh, sentenced Toll to death on the 11th of July, 1945. Solely for this occasion, around 5,000 people gathered on the main square of the town of Vinkovci, where the court read out the judgment and the sentence. One of the villagers, whose parents were killed upon Toll's orders during the war, volunteered to carry out the death sentence. He was allowed to put the robes around Toll's neck, while the two other villagers turned the bench on which Toll was standing therefore executing him by hanging. So in conclusion, Ivan Toll's career demonstrates how closely the persecution of uh, the persecution mass murder of Serbs, Jews, and Roma in the, in, the, in the independent state of Croatia were intertwined. The experiences that Toll, along with his superiors, superiors gained through deporting tens of thousands of Serbs in Vinkovci and Bielina was vital in implementing similar measures against Jews in the later months. Every third Jewish victim of the Holocaust in the independent state of Croatia 
was deliver, delivered to his or her death through deportations organized by Ivan Toll. Ultimately, the shocking swiftness of deportations and the mass murder of virtually all Roma in the independent state of Croatia in a matter of weeks would hardly have been possible without the expertise acquired through the preceding deportations of Serbs and Jews. Therefore, the cleansing operations against one group created preconditions and opportunities for the persecution of other groups. Regional approaches in genocide studies recognize that genocides are launched more intensively and extensively in some provinces while they lag in others. This creates a benchmark of annihilatory success which divides mid-ranking perpetrators among the above norm performers and under performers in genocidal actions. Ivan Toll was one zealous Eustasha perpetrator who advanced the cleansing of provinces he presided over more expeditiously than other Eustasha functionaries. While stationed in Bielina, he was one of the first Eustasha to deport all Jews in his district, earning him a reputation of the expert on the Jewish question. Toll's transfer to Sarajevo as police chief was both a message to those who fell behind in the Im implementation of genocidal measures, as well as a test to see how far Toll could push cleansing operations. In Sarajevo, Toll demonstrated that despite lack of manpower and detention site, and also the unstable transport infrastructure, he could destroy, destroy one of the oldest and most numerous Jewish communities in the Balkans in just, over two, in just over two months. Even though he occupied the position of a mid-rank perpetrator, he fused the position of a desk murderer and a direct killer. From his office desk in Sarajevo, he micromanaged the deportations, often personally deciding who should be deported to concentration camps and who should be kept in detention. Toll was also a man of the terrain, personally leading police officers and the Ustasha agents during various mass arrests and roundups of Serbs, Jews, and Roma. Though, although Toll personally never reached the top level policy making positions within the agencies of the independent state of Croatia, he indirectly influenced them through his personal relationship with the Minister of Interior, Andrei Artukovic, he had access to power, resources, and political protection. In Tol, the ministry and the Minister Artukovic found one of the most loyal executioners who tested various methods of destruction, and therefore they, were, they paved the road to genocide through trial and error. Tol's case demonstrates how zealous individuals could radicalize the genocidal process. Through the combination of a biographical and regional approaches, Toll's case provides insight into the macro, meso, and micro level dynamics, which took place in preparing and implementing genocide in the independent state of Croatia. Thank you for your attention. Okay, let's go ahead and open it up to questions. So anyone would like to begin before I ask? I have a question from online, actually. So were there any specific events which might have served to radicalize soul? Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to answer individual questions or collect more? I think individual ones would be fine. Okay, so... I think uh, specifically, it's very difficult to contextualize him because we don't have uh, a lot of eco documents from his side, meaning we do not have his diary and we do not have insight into his kind of track of thought uh, and, and how he developed and how he saw himself and his actions. So a lot of the information we have about Toy is always from agencies and other people, but not from himself. Very rarely are we left with the sources which where he uh, speaks about himself. Uh, so as someone who has studied this case carefully, 
I can probably say that there's two or three major breaking points where we can really see that he is radicalizing. First of all is his deportation or his exile. We do not know whether it's self-imposed or he was actually exiled by the authorities of the Hungarian uh, newly, uh, newly occupied uh, territories by the Hungarian governments in Subotica. We know that this basically uh, forced him to leave everything he had behind in Subotica and to start a new life in the independent state of Croatia. So I would say this is one of the first uh, paths toward radicalization, which forced him to completely reinvent himself as an individual. And we said the second uh, point would be this transfer from Vinkovci to Bielina, where he was given the secret task uh, to head these deportations of Serbs. And due to this secrecy, he had to do a lot of improvisations. And he kind of re received a blank card that he could do whatever he wanted to make this happen. Uh, and here I see that he is really sometimes even running against the legal orders where he was following them blindly in Vinkovci in the, these first two months. I really see this uh, transfer to Bielina, which means July, August, and September 1941 as being uh, one of the key stepping uh, stones. And then in Sarajevo, we can actually see that he, uh, Tol is even too radical for some of the local uh, Eustachas, and we can really see his anti-Semitism uh, being brought into the forefront in a certain way. Because up until Sarajevo, Tol was mainly concerned with the deportations of Serbs, while somehow in Sarajevo, he kind of disregards the deportations of Serbs from Sarajevo and only focuses on Jews. And here we can really see the most radical expression uh, of his anti-Semitism in, in this stage. But also just some food for thought is, uh, and this is what's kind of puzzling me very often when I think about this case, is just how normalized was it for him that these deportations were taking place? Because he is sort of a man who does not belong anywhere. So he's born in Herzegovina. He leaves Herzegovina because of hunger, settles in Subotica, then is in Subotica for 20 years, then he's deported from there to independent state of Croatia. So his life is sort of always on the move. And it's a question of how much he internalized that this is a new normalcy in uh, sort of the Euro Europe as, as a dark continent during these years, right? Where we have a lot of various... Uh, ethnic cleansing campaigns, a lot of population exchanges, and how much of these population exchanges were internalized by Tol himself as being completely normal and something that is just simply part of the political, uh, of the time he is living in. Um, with the with the question of radicalization, you mentioned that before his arrival in in Vignisi, if I'm pronouncing that correct, in, in May 41, there was this ad hoc campaign of harassment against against Jews and, and Serbs by by Croats and and, and the Volksdeutsch. Um, at least among the Croats, do you have any indication as to their commitment um, to the Ustasha, to to those fascistic ideals? Well, how much of it was was just born of pure nationalism, or with the case of, of, of anti of, of anti semitism, just that that um, sentiment? I think of what young I think of young Gross in Poland and the idea of Holocaust without Nazis and and this idea of just being mm -hmm. very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we do know is that there was initially. Uh, there, there is certain discrepancy on how uh, the Croatian authorities approached the genocide against Jews and the genocide against Serbs. Initially, a lot of historians would say that uh, the Ustasha were mainly concerned with Serbs as the main political enemy because they were the most numerous uh, in Croatia, so they they 
practically formed almost a third of the population of the independent state of Croatia, almost 2 million out of the total population of 6 million. And they were considered as a political threat because they were seen as a kind of a politically privileged class during the kingdom of Yugoslavia, which is pretty much false, but this is the perception from the from Croatian fascism. Uh, so initially there is a lot of pogroms against the Serbian population, which end in mass murder. Uh, while the Croatian authorities are in certain ways trying to contain this violence when it comes to the Jewish uh, victims. So Jews were discriminated, they were robbed, they were looted, their uh, property was nationalized, uh, but the authorities pretty much prevented any ad hoc violence against them when they could. So the genocide against Jews is primarily a state-run genocide, while uh, the genocide against Serb is a combination of concentration camps plus this pogromization. Uh, there are different factors contributing to this. One of them is that Jews were concentrated in urban settings in Croatia. So more than 75% of Jewish population lived in cities, uh, not in the countryside. And therefore they were closer to the centers of authority because the Ustasha mainly held power in cities and towns, rarely in uh, rural areas, especially in multi-ethnic uh, regions. So this pogromization was primarily, at least initially, led by the Volksdeutsche. And uh, this was very, in some cases, like in Osijek, which I studied, uh, there is even some sort of a, an agreement, an unofficial agreement between the local Nazis, uh, the folks uh, who, who are not all Volksdeutsche, of course, not all Volksdeutsche were Nazis, but there is an unofficial agreement that uh, the, the local Germans would persecute and take charge of the persecution of Jews, while Croats and the Ustasha movement would take charge in the persecution of Serbs. However, when uh, Croats realize that they will receive the helm of the state, they're not too happy with this deal uh, because they want Jewish property. They know whoever will control the persecution of Jews at least in their mind, because it's motivated by economic anti-Semitism, they have this idea that Jews are running the local economy. And they think whoever will take charge in the persecution of Jews will take over their businesses, their stores, and therefore they would form the backbone of the future political elite, economic and political elite within various localities, right? Uh, so they're trying to prevent uh, local Germans from doing exactly that. And they try to take as much power from them and especially to remove them from the process of the destruction of the local Jewish communities. Uh, you, we, we need to see this as a, also as a process because there is no initial straightforward plan on how to uh, implement the persecution of uh, the Jewish population. It's pretty much clear that they want to take over their property, but the idea that uh, the Holocaust, as we know it today, would end in mass murder really only crystallizes within the Ustasha regime in, let's say, September and October 1941. There we can really see uh, that there is a certain kind of a plan being put in place. Sorry, David, just as a quick follow up. Um, how does that, that kind of crystallization coincide with partisan activity? Was there an increase that kind of led to that, that more kind of pretext of security concerns? Mm -hmm. So that's a very, very complicated question, which we could have a lecture on <laughs> just in itself. So uh, Doyle plays an important role in that. Uh, because he shows what can be done. So I would say uh, that the, we have clear intent at the leadership level. So when we look at the, uh, what the Ustasha elite in Zagreb is saying uh, in press very openly, that they want to create a state without Jews, right? So that this is stated very openly already in May and uh, June 1941. Just keep in mind that the state was formed in April. So this is very quickly, barely a month after the state was formed, this plan is already outlined. Uh, but this 
I, I would argue we need to use a different layers of analysis here. We cannot analyze the architects and the local police and the regional uh, Eustache officials in the same way. Uh, so what the leadership needs to do is to really educate the lower officials on what they mean by this message. Because we see that when the state officials each issue these orders, arrest all Jews who are considered or suspicious as being communist, we really see a huge diversity of how local officials actually receive the order. In Sarajevo, they don't do pretty much anything. They just say, well, we are arresting people on, on an individual basis if they're communists or not. But this is not what the leadership is trying to say. The leadership openly says Jews are equal communists because they follow the Judeo-Bolshevik myth, which, which should be a message taken by all the local police officials as an order to arrest all Jews. But not, no one gets this message really besides Tol. So this order is issued on the 31st of July. We have mass arrests of Jews on the 1st of August. It includes in certain locations, 10% of the Jewish population. In Sarajevo, no one is arrested on a mass level, only on an individual basis, which means that the police is actually researching and investigating whether someone is genuinely a communist sympathizer or not. So for them being Jewish does not mean necessarily that you are a communist, while Tolly, on the other hand, at the same time, arrests everyone in Bielina. So we have very different responses from the local officials to the orders from the top. So I would say that through months of May, June, July, up until November, December, basically the Eustache elites in Zagreb are educating and they're really conveying what they mean by this order and that the, this really means the deportation of everyone. But this is not a very swift process. So this is a process which takes, takes time. And it really only is uh, implemented fully in August 1942, uh, when we have these deportations to Auschwitz. We should keep in mind, this is very important and something that I didn't mention during my presentation, is that uh, in, the, in the independent state of Croatia, there was around 40,000 Jews. Uh, approximately 30,000 were killed during the Holocaust. And out of that number of 30,000, 23,000 were killed in Croatian camps. So 75% of all the victims were killed in Croatian concentration and death camps, while only 25% were ever deported to Nazi Germany and Nazi German camps. Uh, this is very important because Croatia is very often treated as uh, simply another country which was deporting its own Jewish population to Germany. I, I, run, I go against this interpretation. I'm saying the Ustasha implemented the Holocaust in Croatia because it was a larger, it was a part of their larger policy of ethnic homogenization. So it's not necessarily done because of any German pressure or German influence. It was a central part of their ideology. Uh, and we know very little about any kind of communication between Nazi Germany and uh, the Ustasha leadership. What we do know, uh, and I think that this will be interesting uh, also for students is the minister Artukovic, who I mentioned frequently, issued a request to Nazi Germany in October 1941 of whether Germany would be willing to take Jews from Croatia to their camps, to deport them to the east. And Germany says, no, we cannot take them right now. We, uh, we, should, we should wait until next year. So what happens, we have Anze conference in, in January 1942, and then we have a clear policy by Nazi Germany that uh, they will see the Holocaust as a pan-European uh, 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 event. But the Eustache only make the request for the, this, these deportations of Jews in spring 1942. And these deportations take place, as you can see on this slide in Osijek, 
in August 1942. So the Ustasha actually, by that time, as I said, killed 75% of the Jewish population in Croatia on their own without any German assistance by that time. And this is the climax of the, of the Holocaust in Croatia is really Sarajevo, I would say, because it's a, it's a deportation of 25% of all Croatian Jews in matter of two months. And I would also argue that some of the, toll, uh, some of the actions which Toll uh, uh, took really significantly, significantly expanded the genocidal capacities of the state. For example, the Asenovac camp, which was established in August 1941, uh, was not immediately a, a death camp. It was primarily a forced labor camp. Some people died because of the illnesses and mal malnutrition, but there were no mass murder campaigns immediately when the camp was established. But these mass murders intensify and then they start in October and they intensify in November, which corresponds with the arrival of Jews from Sarajevo. So uh, we can actually interpret and we know from some of the Holocaust survivors from who gave testimonies, for example, to USC Shoah Foundation, is that they really point to this arrival of Sarajevo Jews as a key turning point in transforming transforming Yasenovats from a forced labor camp into a death camp because the, there was no capacity for intake of such large amount of prisoners, which Toll was pretty much shipping uh, to Sarajevo very intensely. I do have a question. <laughs> If I know how to use it. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, I guess Enovats gets almost all the attention for logical reasons. I mean, it's for more people or children than anybody else. Uh, but as early as the Senovats was thought of the mm -hmm. um, And I believe that's where they, that's where the the Ustasha tried to first to implement chemical execution, even before you said about it. Was that something that was produced uh, mostly by uh, the central government, the central Ustasha government in, in Stalagrad, or was it something that, that the Germans were pushing? And I don't know the answer to that, that's why I'm asking. So uh, we have, before Yasenovats, the most important concentration camp was something that we called the Gospic complex. Uh, so just if I can return to the map, so it's a bit clearer on where we are. So the city of Gospic, you can see here, if you can see the map. Can you see the map? <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. So Gospic is here, yeah, uh, and this was the initially the central place where people were deported. So we're talking May, June, July, and Gospic is called a complex because in Gospic itself there was just a transit place where people were deported either to the island of Pag, mostly Jews, and then there was another execution site here which is called Yadovno. And it's pretty much a, a kind of a pit where people were uh, thrown into. And so this was initially the main execution site where approximately 25,000 Serbs and a, a few thousand Jews were not really, uh, there are no precise data uh, here, but let's say three to 4,000 uh, Jews were also killed here. Uh, so this camp is initially the main camp of the Ustasha movement, but what happens is that in August and September 1941, Italy pretty much occupies the southern part of the country. Yeah? So the Ustasha are forced to shut this camp down and open a new national camp. And the new national camp is formed in Yasenovac, which is 
somewhere around here, let's say. Yeah. So this is where the new camp is formed. And the Asenovats is pretty much the main camp throughout the existence. And it has a satellite camp, which our colleague mentioned is Stara Gradishka. But Stara Gradishka is, is opened uh, in 1942 and it uh, becomes primarily a camp for women and children. And in, it is true that uh, the Ustasha experimented with the implementation of gas, especially against children. There are rumors that children were gassed in this camp. Uh, but they also experimented in Yasenovac with various methods of destruction. For example, uh, it is a fairly well-known uh, case in Yasenovac where they tried to create a certain kind of uh, crematorium where people would enter alive. So they would not kill them as in the Nazi German case and then put the bodies in the crematoria they would put these people alive into this crematory and burn them alive. Uh, so they experimented with various methods of uh, destruction in Yasenovats, which included also the, the mass shooting, but then also the usage of knives and blunt weapons against victims. Uh, so Yasenovats operated as a series of these satellite camps, which Stara Gradishka was a part of. I really appreciate the comments that a lot of attention is given to Yasenovats. Uh, I also uh, uh, think that there is too much attention given to Yasenovats because there are 30 other concentration camps which are almost unknown in the independent state of Croatia. One of them is, for example, Jakovo, which you can see, see in the vicinity of Vinkovats here. And Jakovo was one of those camps which was exclusively made for women and children. And virtually all the women from Sarajevo, Jewish women and children from Sarajevo, were deported to Jakovo, while men were taken to Yasenovac. And men were killed immediately, while uh, women and children in Jakovo received a, a, a better treatment uh, because of various reasons. But they themselves were taken from Jakovo in 1942 to Stara Gradishka when Stara Gradishka opened and they were killed there. And a lot of them uh, died because of various uh, diseases. Uh, so, so I hope this answers your question. If, if I can answer it more precisely, uh, uh, feel free to ask more. I have a question from online. One of our online grad students would like to know what sources there are available to put his story together. And for example, where did his anti-Semitism statement come from? Mm. Okay, so very good question. So this, uh, this, this is pretty much turning into an article and it's going to be published this year. Uh, and I've been working on this case uh, for pretty much two years uh, because Toll was active in various locations, as, as you could have seen. And it's very difficult to uh, get a clear picture from him. So this is a compilation of sources from more than five or six different archives. Uh, I went to two different archives in Sarajevo. One of them is the state, the federal state, state archives of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and another archive is uh, the museum, the historical museum in Sarajevo has its own uh, archive and two collections related to the history of the independent state of Croatia. And then I also spent some time in the state archives of Sarajevo, which have a very rich uh, collection, very nice collection for the Second World War. And then of course in Zagreb, there is uh, a lot of materials from various ministries, uh, from various uh, regional authorities, which are just collected in Zagreb itself. Uh, the archives in Slavonski Brod also contain some material primarily concerning uh, the Volksdeutsche and the history of, of ethnic German communities across uh, Croatia. And uh, the archives in Vinkovci are also helpful. I also used uh, sources such as uh, testimonies of victims, which are located in various uh, publications, uh, the Jewish community, 
the Alliance of Jewish Communities of Yugoslavia published uh, eight or nine volumes. Uh, actually, I, I have it here. It's just a second. <laughs> <laughs> I'm alive. Uh, so this is a very interesting collection, which is called We Survived. And uh, it's published by the Jewish community in, in, uh, in Belgrade. And they collected testimonies from hundreds and hundreds of survivors and compiled them into these uh, collections through the years. Uh, you can also find them online in English which is very helpful. Uh, I can send the link to Amber and maybe she can distribute it. I hope that the link is still available. I downloaded them, uh, I downloaded them a couple of years ago. Uh, so, so this is very, very helpful because there are some testimonies in here which you cannot find in the archives. Uh, for example, for Bielina, the city of Bielina, I couldn't find much testimonies, uh, but in these collections you can. And then the USC Shoah was also helpful. Uh, USC Shoah contains more than 53,000 testimonies of, of victims, uh, of survivors of the Holocaust. And for the independent state of Croatia, there is around 600 of them, which is a massive amount of material considering that each testimony is around two to two and a half hours. So that's about 1,200 hours of material, uh, which is, yeah, yeah. It takes a while to go through them, but uh, you can you can search them through keywords of different locations and last names. So, uh, but in terms of research which has been conducted so far, I'm quite shocked that Toll is uh, completely under researched. So we don't have a single paper book, uh, anything published about this guy. We have a couple of sentences in some overviews of Sarajevo or overviews of uh, Vinkovci, he would be mentioned here or there, but we do not have a single systematic study which would kind of bring this picture together, which is, uh, which shows a certain kind of disbalance in the scholarship, I would say right now, because if we do not have the information on some people who participated in the deportations of 70,000 people, uh, uh, that's a problem. So many, many scholars would say we know so much about the Holocaust and it's pretty much overstudied. We need to turn to memory politics and we need to turn to, to other kind of alternative topics. I would say there's still a lot of the materials which we, we should research, especially in a comparative lens. I think there is a lot that we can learn about perpetrators and decision-making uh, through comparisons of Nazi Germany, Croatia, Romania, especially these governments which had more independent regimes. That's the question I want to ask. Uh, uh, do we have a minute? Uh, yeah, we have, uh, we have about three, two to three minutes. Do you mind giving us a little bit more of your time, Lovro? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, sweet. We'll do one more question and then we'll wrap it up. Excellent. I'm Kevin Amon. I'm a trained oh. journalist. Uh, uh, some years ago, so my optic is very historic, right? Uh, very, very Ian Kershaw working toward the Fuhrer, uh, an optic like that. Uh, and basically, everything I know about the independent state of Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina has been filtered through Emmy, Emily Griebel's book about Sarajevo. Uh, I missed the beginning of your talk, so perhaps you, you mentioned it. I don't remember. Uh, and the question is this, I, the, the presentation of Toya as a, as a genocidal outperformer, that makes somebody like me, trained in the German-based historiographic world, really uncomfortable. Because to me, reading it through Griebel's thesis about the unique intercultural aspects of a town like Sarajevo, which I think you've also beautifully reflected in some other places that I didn't know anything about, uh, that the that intercultural complexity is more the causal element 
in the unique outcomes of the genocide, mm -hmm. rather than the that something in this person that drove him to be uh, somehow uniquely genocidal. Uh, and so that's, uh, I mean, that's, I phrased it more as my opinion rather than as a question. The question for you would be, uh, is, is there any way you think we can help determine which, which it is, right? Is it a more causal element? Uh, that is, uh, Toya's uniqueness, more the causal element? Or this intercultural complexity more the causal element? Hmm. That's complicated. It's historiographic. They probably unanswerable, uh, but maybe we give it a try. Thank you. It's a very good question. It's a very, very, very good question. So, ooh, uh, I really like Emily Grable's book. Uh, I have to say, but I do disagree a little bit with the thesis. And uh, the thesis for for those who haven't read the book is that uh, there sort of the genocide against Serbs in Sarajevo, which is very, um, I, how do I put this, strangely absent in comparison to other locations. Uh, so Sarajevo had a fairly large Serbian population, but uh, unlike many other places, the deportations were not so radically enforced as in other locations. And Emily Grable tells us uh, that this is in part because of Sarajevo's kind of local identity, uh, the identity which is tied to uh, inter-ethnic dialogue, tolerance, convivenza, well, however you want to call it. So due to the tradition of tolerance and multi-ethnicity of the location, which go dates back to Ottoman period, kind of uh, disabled the main drive of the genocide in Sarajevo, right? So this is, let's say, simplified, but this is the overall thesis. Uh, I see that regarding the Roma population because the Muslim elites in Sarajevo managed to convince the central authorities in Zagreb that uh, all those Roma who are uh, Muslim should not be persecuted. And the central authorities said, okay, pretty much. Yeah, so there was place to negotiate the racial politics of the independent state of regime, uh, in the independent state of Croatia, if the regime felt threatened that a part of the elites would be alienated. So they, they fear that without of the support of the Muslims, they would not be able to man maintain the state and therefore they're ready to make compromises with them for the protection of the portion of the Roma population which identifies itself as Muslim. Uh, we can also see this tolerance and sort of courage to intervene regarding the persecution of Serbs in Sarajevo. But what is really strangely absent is the interventions for the Jewish community. And I do not see enough or any serious interventions from the Muslim or the Catholic side for their Jewish neighbors who are in Sarajevo for 500 years before that, yeah? And this is where I see Grable's thesis as being relatively weak because she cannot explain if there is tolerance and tradition of helping each other, why isn't the Jewish community preserved in Sarajevo? And uh, your question uh, uh, hints at that is, it's both. It's Sarajevo itself, which is very irritating to Toll. Uh, and Toll wants to move in stages. And I would argue that Jew Jews were the first stage and that he would proceed with the deportations of Serbs and anyone else who, who he sees and as not being Eustasha enough. Uh, but he is being stopped by the local Eustachas themselves. Uh, so I think this is kind of an abortive genocide in a way, uh, because he would probably move on if he was not stopped. Uh, and on the other hand, so I would say that he definitely sees that Sarajevo needs to be Croatized, which means the elimination of anyone who doesn't belong into the Eustasha conception of Croatian nation. But on the other hand, I would also say that Toll uh, is 
radicalized before Sarajevo. So he, he as, as I said, I think Bielina plays a central role. I think his previous life in, in, in Subotica uh, uh, plays a certain, certain role as well. But what is really surprising for me and still shocking and something that I still grapple with is this really sudden change that he is so normal there is really nothing pointing to this career which he had this infamous career he had during his interwar period uh he 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 completely belongs into the multi-ethnic environment of subotica he has no issues working with serbs or you know, working with Jews, he was sitting in the same boards and same same uh, organizations with his Jewish and Serbian uh, 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 kind of citizens of, of Subotica for 10, 15, 20 years. And there is no indication he ever had a problem with that. And this radical transformation of Tol in matter of really two to three months is I think I think it speaks to the power of how this anthropological revolution that fascism wants to create this idea that they want to want to have a radical break with the previous moral order and they want to create new men who would be radically transformed morally. I think Toy is a case for that and how quickly fascist ideology and fascist regimes in certain cases can produce this really new man who is completely morally reformed into what fascism expects them to be. Thank you, fantastic. All right, I, we have one more quick question and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. I don't have a question, I have a comment. Thank you for joining us. Um, talked about Toll finding meaning from political turmoil, and I wrote that down because it's very haunting for me to think about that. Um, it, I think it underscores for me and probably other educators in the room how important it is um, to work with our college students in higher education to find meaning, um, find meaning in, life, in their lives and their work. And um, I just want to thank you for pointing that out, for, for using an example with us today um, of, of someone that perhaps was finding meaning, we might say, in, in the wrong places, uh, and that we need as educators to assist our students in finding that meaning. So thank you for sharing your evening, your evening, our day. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, thank you for joining us at 10.30. It's now, what, 11.30 there for you, Lovro? Um, I'm gonna uh, go ahead and wrap up if we wanna give Lovro one final round of applause. And just a reminder for those of you here today, we will be screening the film Everything is Illuminated at the Hay Public Library on Thursday evening at 6 p.m. And the Forsyth Library still has an exhibit up with digital QR codes, so I recommend that you take a gander at that. And of course, there is a display at the public library right now, so use that library card, go out and do some reading. Um, otherwise, thank you for taking the time to spend your afternoon with us today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at the rest of the events this month. <laughs>